All right, now we're moving on to structural analysis. Okay, which is not surprisingly the analysis of structures. The first one to look at for most of the, uh, this week is simple trusses. Okay, a simple truss is we're taking a look at a beam, and then there's a pin joint, several other beams, okay? Multiple beams being joined together by, uh, by pin joints. Again, truss members. Joined it and joined. Okay, we're going to start with, and well, mostly what we're going to spend more time with, is a planar truss, which is a 2D truss, okay, where all the beams are in one plane, hence planar truss, okay, supports these support bridges and roofs. We have a couple of assumptions we make with these. A couple of assumptions we make with planar, planar uh, trusses. One is all loadings are applied at joints. Okay, if there's a load in the middle of a beam somewhere, uh, it becomes a different type of problem. We're not able to analyze it as a simple truss. We end up uh, treating it as a frame or a machine. So there's ways we can deal with it if the load's not applied to the joint. But the, the joint, uh, the, um, the truss analysis is only going to work if the loading is applied to joints. The other assumption we have to make, the other assumption we do make is smooth pins. Is that they're smooth pins at each of these joints. Okay, the idea there is that there's really these these beams tend to be thin and straight and don't support moment very well. So what we're going to say is that they can't. Um, that we're going to assume that these are free to move however they want, and we have to support it using only tension and compression in these beams. Again, a long narrow beam is very strong in tension and compression, but very weak in bending. So um, that allows us to kind of take our approach. And analyzing trusses. So, simple strategies here for looking at trusses. Each truss member because the loading is only at the end point and only at the joints, which is the end points of each beam of each member, each truss member acts as a two-force member. Okay, so our truss member is either going to be in tension or obviously the opposite in compression. Okay, so We'll start with a simple example here. There's two primary strategies for analyzing trusses. And which one you want to use depends oftentimes on what you're looking for and what you're given. The first is called the method of joints. Okay, method of joints examines forces at each joint. Okay, it does so independently. Okay, all forces acting at the joint.
concurrent. That means they all come either into, straight into, or straight out of the joint. Again, we're treating the joint as a single point, so it's almost as like if we're treating it as an equilibrium of a particle problem. Okay, where all the forces are either into or out of that point, and the joint, each joint, must be in equilibrium. So, again, um, we end up drawing free body diagrams of each individual joint. So, a simple example here, without any numbers really, we just have a nice, simple triangular truss here truss A, B, C. And say we have a 500 Newton force applied horizontally at B. Okay, what we do is we draw the free body diagram of B. Free body diagram of B, oh yeah, point B. Okay, we're gonna draw FAB. That's the force in beam AB. We're gonna draw FBC, the force in beam BC. And we're going to have 500 newtons here. Okay. Notice I've drawn these pointed out of point B. I do that on purpose. I draw, just like in uh, with support forces, I tended to draw things in the positive direction. In uh, for um, free body diagrams involving joints, uh, involving method of sections, which comes up next. I tend to, I not tend to, I always draw them in uh, tension. Okay, pulling away from the point. That means, that allows me, so that if it comes out negative, I just know it's in compression, okay? If I start guessing at which direction things are, it can get confusing if I guess wrong. So I'm just going to make them all tension, and then I know negative is compression and it all works, okay? So here I could start at point B, and I could analyze, find out um, summation of forces in X, summation of forces Y, figure out what FBAB is and FBC is. Then I know this one and this one. I can move to one of the other points and find FAC. We'll do that here in a little bit of an example. Okay. So. Let's take a look here if I have a truss. joint supporting it there. We're going to have a roller here. Okay, just like, and I'm going to label my points here, A, B, C, and D. Okay, just like any other structure that a truss is going to need to be supported. Okay, so there are going to be support forces acting on any truss. Oftentimes, that's the first thing you need to find is the support force. Most of the time, that's the first thing you need to find. Okay, so in terms of applied loading here, we've got two forces applied. We're going to have a 400 Newton force downward at B and a 600 Newton force to the right at D. Okay, now we know because of our supports here, roller is going to give us a Y. And the pin joint here is going to give us CY and CX. Okay. Now, this becomes, I should have written the problem statement beforehand, but find find the force in each member. state, whether it's in tension or compression. Okay, so that means this problem, this little tiny truss here has one, two, three, four, five members in it. So we're actually dealing with five unknowns at this point. Okay, well, five 
and then the three support forces, that means eight unknowns. So trusses become fairly lengthy problems when you use method and joint. Um, the nice thing is this method always works. We'll be able to work through it and get what we need. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this entire structure. Looking at the entire structure, I'm going to be able to analyze, I'm going to be able to figure out what some of these support forces are. So looking at summation of forces in the x equals zero, that gives me, again, looking at the whole beam, I'm not looking at individual points in this, uh, in this truss yet, I'm looking at the entire truss. So there are one, two, three, four, five forces I've drawn acting on the entire truss. So we'll do that. Summation of forces in the x is equal to cx plus 600 equals zero. This gives me that cx is equal to minus 600 newtons. So I'll put that in here. Okay. We have summation of forces in the y. Well, summation of forces in the y, we have ay minus 400 plus CY. That's too many unknowns. Okay. Oh, one thing I haven't given you yet is the dimensions. Okay. The total height here is four meters. And this thing from A to B horizontally is three meters. And from B and from B to D horizontally is also three meters. Okay, so we don't have enough to solve for this yet. We need to use summation in a moment. And looking around, the one that makes sense is to take a moment about C because that's going to cause the most things to drop out. Okay, so summation of moments about C equals zero. Okay, so we have, we'll start here, 400 newtons causing a rotation counterclockwise. So that's 400 times that distance is three meters. Okay, we have AY, that is causing rotation clockwise, so minus AY, that distance is six meters. And then we have down here the 600 newtons causing counterclockwise times its distance, its vertical distance here is four meters. Okay, so solving this, we have 0 equals 1200 minus 6ay plus 2400. Bring this over, solve it out, we get ay is equal to 3600 uh, 3, by 6 is 600 newtons. And let me double check the math there because I'm not trusting myself right now. And it does end up being positive. So Ay is a positive 600 newtons. So this goes in here. Okay. So I'm done with this. I can go back looking at summation of forces of the y now. This is now 600 minus 400 plus Cy equals zero. Combine this, negative 600 plus 400 Cy is a negative 200 newtons. So see why I'm actually going to reverse this. C, believe it or not, is holding it down, which is a little surprising, but it is. Okay, C is pushing down on this thing with 200 newtons. Okay, and I'm going to redraw CX to make it go in the correct direction as well. So now all my forces have uh, positive values in the directions that they've been drawn. Okay. So what this allows me to do now is start to do free body diagrams and solve what each of these values are. I don't need that anymore. So what I'm going to do is just kind of set up a table here. So A, B. I'll do it this way. F, A, B. F, that's A, B, F, A, D, F, B, C, F, B, D, 
and FCD. Those are my five trust members, my five beams. So what I can do is I can look at each of these and solve them out. Okay, at this point, at each point within this truss, we're going to have two equations. Okay, we don't work with moments when we're working with method of joints. It's all about forces. And in a 2D problem, we have summation forces Y, summation forces X. Okay, so we can't choose a point where we have more than, one, more than two unknowns. If I drew a free body diagram of point D, out of one, two, three unknown forces, only two equations, I'm not going to be able to solve it. Okay, same thing point B, I have one, two, three unknowns, too many. I could choose point A and deal with this one and this one, or point C, which is what I think I'm going to do here, and get some of these values. So point C, draw the free body diagram of point C. See we have the 600 Newton applied force there. We have 200 Newtons applied downward. Okay, we have BC. I'm going to use this. Okay, BC, I'm going to draw out of C. So this is F, B, C. And then I'm going to draw the other force here, F, C, D, right here. That's point C. Okay. So as I've drawn it, I have two forces to the left, two forces downward. Obviously something's, not, something's going to have to change direction here. But this just becomes summation of forces in the X is equal to zero, obviously. We have minus FBC minus 600 equals zero. So FBC, whoops, uh, yep, drawn intention is going to equal, that's correct, so this is FBC is going to equal negative 600 newtons. Okay, so what that means is FBC, because I drew it in tension, out of point of pulling away from C, we got negative. That means FBC is here, is 600 newtons in compression. Okay, positive and negative is not enough to distinguish tension from compression when you're just when you're showing your answer. Okay, you need to, you need to actually state tension or compression when the problem says tension and compression. Okay, here I drew it in tension. It came out negative, that means I know it has to be the other. Okay, I'm going to do the same thing here. Summation of forces in the y equals 0 is equal to negative 200 minus FCD. That gives me FCD is equal to negative 200 newtons, which means FCD is also, it's 200 newtons, and it's also in compression. Okay, so we're good there. Those are our two pieces there. And I know for this, something like this, where it's two forces in the X and two forces in the Y, nothing at angles or anything like that, it's almost, it would be much easier to just kind of look at it for a lot of you just be able to identify by inspection by just looking at it and telling me what those forces are. But it's a good habit to get into to drawing this out. So when we do get to ones that are a little bit more complicated, we can work with them. So now, we can go and look at another piece here. Okay, this is, now we know this piece and this piece. So now we can go ahead and look at point B or look at point D. We have fewer, uh, fewer unknowns. I'm going to look at point D. Free body diagram at point D. We have 600 newtons to the right. We have the three members F, C, D. F, B, D, and F, A, D. Okay. Now we're going to need to know, well, this thing here is nice. We have a 3, 4, 5 right triangle. So this is 3, 4, 5. So that will be nice in terms of identifying the components of that one off at an angle. Okay. So we're going to do the same thing with, with um, summation of forces in the X and Y. However, we know FCD, 200 newtons in compression. I drew it in tension, so I'm going to make this negative 200 newtons. Okay. However you want to keep this straight in terms of tension and compression in your signs uh, is up to you. I will generally always draw forces in tension, and if they're in compression, I'll still have a negative number. 
That way, if I get a negative number, I know it's compression, uh, and if I sum in a negative number, if it is compression. It just allows me to keep positive as tension, negative as compression throughout everything I do if I always draw it in tension. That's how I find it easiest to keep things straight. If you would like to keep doing something differently, um, that's fine, but keep in mind that, that sometimes it does get confusing. Okay, so we have summation of forces in the X is equal to, we have 600, well it's equal to zero first of all, which is equal to 600 minus FAB minus the X component of FBD, which is three-fifths of that. Okay. Then we have summation of forces in the Y equals zero. Well, this equals negative 200 plus four-fifths FBD. FAD has no Y component, so we're stuck there, so we're done with this. This is nice and easy, we can solve for FBD right away. So we have 200 equals 4 fifths of FBD, FBD divided by 4 fifths, uh, that's 1,000 by 4 is 250. That came out positive, so that's intention. Okay, so that's y. Now we can go ahead and look at x. In x we have 0 equals 600 minus fad, uh, which is what we don't know, minus 3 fifths of fbd, which is 250. Okay, so this is fad. That comes over. 600 minus three-fifths of 250 is 150, FAD is 450. And FAD is also positive, so FAD is 450 newtons, and that is in tension. Okay, so we got four out of the five already. Okay, all we need to do is find this FAB piece. All right, so at this point we've, we've done two free body diagrams. We could move on to free body diagram A or of B. I'm going to do A because it's only got three forces as opposed to, oh, my little check marks on here. Uh, I'll do a free body diagram of A because it's got, uh, it's got only three forces as opposed to four. It, be, it might be a little easier. So the free body diagram at A, we have 600 newtons upward. We have FAD and we have FAB. Okay. This is also a three, four, five, right triangle. So this is also three, four, five. Okay. That was intentional. So here we have the, we can do summation of forces again. Summation of forces in the X equals zero, or summation of forces in the Y equals zero. We're end up gonna, only going to end up needing one of these, but I'll do them both out. So in the X we have FAD plus three-fifths of FAB. Or for Y, we have 600 plus four-fifths of FAB. Okay. Either one, we know FAB is 450, so we can go ahead and work with this either way. FAB, we'll just do this one, so we end up with negative 600 equals four-fifths FAB divided by four fifths. Uh, what's that? Six times point. Uh, do this on the calculator so I'm not screwing up. Three thousand by four should be seven fifty. Yeah, seven fifty. FAB is a negative seven fifty. Okay. So FAB is 750 newtons, oops, negative, so that's compression. All right, so that is our answer. We found the loading in all five of those beam members, and we found out tension and compression. It's just a simple matter of 
summation forces x, summation forces y all the way through. And again, it doesn't matter how big your truss is, you're always just going to be able to walk your way through it, doing, looking at one joint at a time. Sometimes it gets long, but you're always going to be able to do it this way. This, the method of joints always works. Um, the next piece we have to look at is something that, a trick that sometimes will allow you to shorten these a little bit. There's another method of solutions called the method of sections, which sometimes is shorter, but in both, both methods of solution, sometimes if you can spot what are called zero force members, that can save you some time. Okay, a zero force member is just a member that supports no load, no tension, no compression. So if I have a big fancy truss here, here like this, um, this is going to drop down here, we're going to have a piece here, that's a joint, this is a roller, supported there, we have a pin joint here, we have a, uh, we'll just label things here, A, B, C, D, E, F. And if my only applied load is right here at point E, okay, if I do a free body diagram of point A, that looks like Summation forces on the x tells you FAB has to equal zero. Summation forces on the y tells you FAF has to equal zero. Okay, so when you see a member off on its own here, oftentimes you're going to be able to spot the fact that it's not supporting anything. Anytime you have a joint where there's only one beam acting in the x or only one beam acting in the y, you know that has to be a zero force member. Okay, I can do the same thing here at joint D. Okay. Well, I have CD down here, and over here I have FED. Well, summation forces in the X tells me FED has to equal zero. Summation forces in the Y, well, we do have two forces in the Y. We have FED has a Y component, and FCD is in the Y. But we already said this was zero, so that means this has to be zero as well. Okay, we've essentially eliminated four beams out of this truss, and we're, there's going to be a five, BC is not going to have a load as well, okay? Essentially, this truss is really just these three beams, okay? But if you tried to do this method of joints, you'd walk all the way through here, and probably not, it'd take a lot of time identifying all these as having zeros. Okay, so if you can identify quickly a zero force member, it can sometimes save you some time. Uh, taking a look at another a more realistic example, I have variation of a how truss. Yeah, straight down. This goes here, this goes here, this goes here, this goes here. Uh, a, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Okay, my loading here. I'm going to have 5 kilonewtons here, and then at B, I'm going to have 2 kilonewtons. Alright, there are a couple of zero force members in this, in this situation. Okay, um, give you a second here to look and try and spot them. Again, you're looking for points where there's only one, um, only one force acting in the X or the Y. Okay. So the first, I think, and the most obvious here, is if you do the free body diagram at point G, we have FCG here, FGF here, 
F G H here. Well, G H and uh, F G will stay in alphabetical order. Okay. They're going to be equal and opposite, but not necessarily zero. Summation of forces in the Y tells you F C G has to be zero. So F C G supports no weight, supports no load in this problem. So you can essentially leave it out. The other one, which is not going to be quite so easy to spot, is over here at D. Okay, if we look at joint D, okay, again, if you don't spot these, you can walk through it with method of joints and you'll be you'll figure it out along the way anyway. But sometimes this can save you a little time. So joint D here. Okay, summation of forces in X and Y looks like you're going to have three forces in the Y, three forces in the X, but what you can do with this is if you tilted your axes and you made X and Y like this, all of a sudden the summation of forces in the X or have FCD and FDE equal, summation of forces in the Y is going to tell you that FDF is zero. So this one is also zero. Okay, so there were two pieces on here that, that were zero, okay? Actually, there is a third. If you keep looking here, now that we know df is zero, if we look at point f, we have fdf, which we already said was zero. We have f e. G and uh, straight up here, off to the angle here, we have FCF. Okay, summation forces in the X, we have these two, they're going to be non zero, we're going to have this piece as well. Summation forces in the Y, FG and EF don't contribute. CF, this is already zero, so that means CF has to be zero. Okay, summation of forces in the Y tells you that that's not going to give you anything here. So we were able to able to eliminate three beams, just identifying them as zero force members, without actually doing any math. Okay. Which makes things a lot easier for trying to analyze this whole thrust. There's eight, ten members on this thing. Uh, if we can eliminate three of them, that saves us a good chunk of work. Again, if you don't see them, it doesn't matter. You just end up doing it all the way out. Um, it can save you a little time if you spot the zero force members, but it's not great. In reality, zero force members are uh, included uh, as sort of a safety factor or redundancy. If this thing starts to buckle, all of a sudden the geometry changes a little bit. These are not going to be zero force members anymore. They might start supporting loads. So oftentimes, if you look at a truss, um, it'll look like something's a zero force member um, as it's built. It's there as a safety factor, as a redundancy. Um, but in analyzing it, in the ideal case we work with in the classroom and on pencil and paper, um, you're, those are going to be zero. It's only once things start to bend and shift a little bit, the geometry changes, and then, they, uh, then those are non-zero anymore. And you'll learn how to deal with that when, we, uh, when you get to mechanics and materials, if you continue in that direction. Um, the other piece we have to do, the other solution method here, is called method of sections. Okay. In this case, you cut the truss, or structure, or whatever you're dealing with. For now, it's just going to be trusses. In two sections, you get two sections, to find internal forces. So, for example, here, if I have a big ugly truss, a pin here, and a roller spring here, okay, and we have a lot of other garbage going on here, and we have a load over here. 
1,000 newtons. And we'll do A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Um, geometry here, we'll make this 2 meters. We'll make each of these also 2 meters. Okay. To do this with method of joints would mean first finding the support forces, okay? finding the D and E for the support forces. And then either starting at D or starting at E or starting at A, walking your way through joint by joint all the way through until you found all the beams. Now, if I ask for everything, you, there's no shortcut. You kind of have to do that. But what if you only cared about in a couple of pieces. So in BC, CG, and FG. So this beam, this beam, and this beam. Okay. If we only care about that, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to essentially cut this truss right here. Okay. And separate it into two pieces. So what I'm going to do here is erase this half of this and I'll redraw it. So these internal beams, okay, we're gonna draw this here. And Now normally it's not necessary to redraw everything, you can just start with a free body diagram, but considering this is the first example, I'm going to draw it all out. Okay, so essentially now I've sliced it down this piece. And these beams BC, CG, and FG, i.e. the three I care about, have been cut in half. Okay, so instead of those beams, these are going to be, I'm going to treat them as forces. Okay? Because if I were to draw, thinking of method of joints, if I were to draw a free body diagram of point C, I'd have FBC in this direction, FCG in this direction, CF in this direction, CD in this direction. Okay? So we still have these other pieces. We're just going to draw these forces. Um, we're just going to draw these beams as forces, as we would in the free body diagram anyway, but now we're going to draw them like this. And notice that they are opposite each other. Again, Newton's third law, every for, um, the forces occur in pairs. If it's pulling on this way on B, it's got to pull equal and opposite on C. Okay? Same thing with C and G and F and G. What this allows us to do here is look at the free body diagram of one half or the other. Okay, if we look at this, on the left-hand side, we have one, two, three unknowns, which we can work with. We have one known. Okay, over here we have one, two, three, four, five, six unknowns when you count the support forces. Okay, we have EX, DX, DY. Okay, we have those support forces. So we have the three support forces and the three unknowns here. This is six unknowns. It's too many for a two dimensional problem. But looking at the left hand side, we have these three unknowns and one known. We can actually do a free body diagram. We can treat this whole thing. Um, we can do, some, uh, do an equilibrium analysis of this piece and work through it without too much of a problem. So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to get rid of this whole side because we don't care. This is going to be F and that is BC. This is F uh, C G and this is F F G. Those are the three we're looking for. Okay. Now we can go ahead and do an analysis here. We're going to take the uh, geometry here. This is still two meters. And if you recall, point C was also over here two meters, so up to over two. This is a 45 degree angle here. FCG goes up at a 45. Okay, so we have summation of forces in the X equals zero, 
that's FBC plus FCG times the cosine of 45 plus, I'm running out of board space here, plus F, FG. Okay? So then we go summation of forces in the Y, it's going to be easier. This one we've only got two. We've got FCG sine 45. minus 1,000. Okay, so we can actually find FCG using this. So FCG is equal to 1,000 divided by sine 45, which equals FCG and that is a positive value, so that FCG is one four one four newtons in tension. Okay. We still don't have enough here. We still have too many unknowns to work with this. But what we can do now, we've used one. Of, we still have one more equilibrium equation, and that's summation of moments. Okay, we could take moment about G, which makes sense because we lose two of these. Uh, we could actually take moment about any of the three points. That works. You can also actually take moment about a point outside. Okay, we could have, we had our point C over here. We are allowed to take moment about point C. It still works. Okay, it's a little bit more confusing because you're taking moment about a point outside the structure, but it's still fair. It still works. Um, in this case, moment about G makes the most sense. We'll do that. Summation of moment about point G equals, okay, we have the do, 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 do. Uh, summation of moment about G, okay, we have FBC, so this equals zero. FBC is going clockwise, so that's negative, times the height is two. Okay, the perpendicular distance there is two, and we have this. Uh, this force of A, this 1,000 Newton force, is causing a counterclockwise moment. So that's plus 1,000 times its perpendicular distance is 2. No, no, it's 2. Okay, so now we have FBC is very simply going to equal 1,000. So FBC, 1,000 Newtons in tension. So that's two of the three. Then we're left with this third one here, summation of forces in the x. So zero equals FBC, which was 1,000, plus FCG, which was 1414, cosine 45, plus FFG. All right, so zero equals 1,000, plus 1414 cosine 45 is 1,000. FFG, FFG is negative 2,000 newtons, so FFG is 2,000 newtons in compression. Okay. So that is how you can solve for something in the middle of a truss without solving the entire truss. Okay. When you're looking at these things, Identifying where to cut is usually the trickiest part. So if we're looking at, back to our bigger we trust here. Wherever you cut it, you want to make sure you end up with, you never want to cut through more than three beams. I mean, you can certainly do a cut like this if you want, and then section this whole piece off, and this piece here. But you've cut one, two, three, four, five different beams. You're going to end up with five unknowns. In a 2D problem, you can't have five unknowns. You don't have enough to solve that. So you never want to, be, you never want to cut more than three beams. And then you want to make sure, if possible, that one side or the other doesn't have any additional unknowns. In this case, 
we had the one known force over here of a thousand, we had three unknowns over here in our support forces. So when we cut through three beams, we were able to look at the left half and not worry about it. Okay, we're able to cut through the right half. If we were to look at the right half, we'd still have too many unknowns. If there's a case where, for instance, we have another unknown, so uh, for instance, if I change this slightly, and instead of the roller being here, if we had a roller here, and an applied load over here, well now if I cut it, I have an unknown here, a couple unknowns here. That's not a huge problem. What you can do is you can look at the entire truss first, find the support forces, just like the first thing you do in a method of joints problem. Once you know those support forces, then you can section it and work with one side or the other. So essentially in this case, if I were to label these points the same way they were, A, B, C, D, E, and F, and G, okay? At this point, we'd have, in terms of support, we'd have an AY, we'd have a DX, and a DY, okay? What I would do is I'd use the entire truss to find AY, DY, and DX, and then I could section it. And I could work with the left half where I know AY, and I have my three unknown beams. Or I can work with the right half where I know DY, DX, 1000, and my three unknown beams. Okay, so sometimes even with method of sections, you do have to find the support forces first. In the example we did, it was nice in that the left-hand side, everything was known. It made things a little simpler. But again, method of joints, method of sections, the two approaches that will solve a truss.